This is a story about an innocent man who languished in prison for 26 years while two attorneys who knew he was innocent stayed silent. As we first reported earlier this year, they did so because they felt they had no choice. Alton Logan was convicted of killing a security guard at a McDonald's in Chicago way back in 1982. Police arrested him after a tip and got three eyewitnesses to identify him, even though Logan, his mother, and his brother all testified he was at home asleep when the murder occurred. But a jury found him guilty of murder. Now, new evidence reveals that Logan did not commit that murder, something that was not new to those two attorneys who knew it all along but say they couldn't speak out until now. Alton Logan's story cuts to the core of America's justice system. We met Alton Logan in prison. Mr. Logan? How you doing? He spent half of his life here. Do you still count the months and the days? And There's no need to count the months and the days. Just count the years. You must have been angry a lot during this time. If I say the first five, six years, I was consumed by anger. Then it comes to the realization that why be angry over something you can't control? Did you commit that murder? No, I did not. What did you think when you were arrested for that murder? I thought it was crazy. These two attorneys, Dale Coventry and Jamie Kuntz, knew Logan had good reason to think that. Why? Because they knew he was innocent. And they knew that because their client, Andrew Wilson, who they were defending for killing two policemen, confessed to them that he had also killed the security guard at McDonald's. That's the crime that Logan was charged with. We got information that Wilson was the guy and not Alton Logan. This was just a month after Wilson had been arrested. So we went over to the jail, immediately almost, and said, is that true, was that you? And he said, yep, it was me. Just as casually as you just said it? Yes. Yeah, he, sort of, he just about hugged himself and smiled. I mean, he was kind of gleeful about it. It was a very strange response. How did you interpret that response? It was true, and that he was tickled pink. He was pleased that the wrong guy had been charged. It was like a game, that he'd, and he'd gotten away with something. But there was just no doubt whatsoever that it was true. I mean, I said, it was you with the shot, you killed the guy, and he said, yes. And then he giggled. The problem was, the killer was their client. So legally, they had to keep his secret, even though an innocent man was about to be tried for murder. I know a lot of people who would say, hey, if the guy's innocent, you've got to say so. You can't well, let him rest because of that. The majority of the public apparently believes that. But if you check with attorneys or ethics committees or, you know, uh, anybody who has, uh, knows the rules of conduct for attorneys, it's very, very clear. Um, it's not morally clear, but we're in a position to where we have to maintain client confidentiality, just as a priest would or a doctor would. It's just a requirement of the law. The system wouldn't work without it. So that was the dilemma. They couldn't speak out, they felt, but how could they remain silent? Well, did you contemplate doing something about it? We wrote out an affidavit. Uh, we made an affidavit that we had gotten information through privileged sources that Alton Logan was not, in fact, guilty of killing uh, the officer, that, in fact, somebody else did. But we wanted to put in writing to memorialize, you know, to get a, a notarized record of the fact that we had this information back then, so that if... You know, 20 years later, 10 years later, what? If something allowed us to talk, as we are now, we could at least, you know, we, we'd at least have an answer to someone who said, you're just making this up now. They sealed the affidavit in an envelope and put the envelope in a lockbox to keep it safe under Dale Coventry's bed. While the attorneys kept silent about Logan's innocence, the jury in this courthouse convicted him of murder. Then the jurors had to decide whether to sentence him to death. I was in court the day they were dealing with the death penalty. I mean, Why did you go to court? Because I had this information that this innocent guy was up there and the jury was deciding whether they're going to kill him or not. How did you feel when you went into the courtroom? Was your heart racing? Oh, yeah. I um, mean, it was, it, it was just creepy. I was looking at the jurors thinking, my God, they're going to decide to kill the wrong guy. And the jury decided? They decided not to kill him. It was a 10 to 2 vote. 10 for, 2 against. Two individuals saved my life. And, we had and saved Kuntz and Coventry from coming forward. We thought that somehow we would stop at least the execution. We weren't going to let that go. But instead he was sentenced to life in prison. 
and you did not do anything. That's right. right. So it was okay to prevent his execution if necessary, but it was not okay to prevent his going to prison for the rest of his life. Morally, there's very little difference, and we tar tar were torn about that. But in terms of the canons of ethics, there is a difference. You can prevent a death. But the minute he was not sentenced to death, the minute he was sentenced to life in prison, he decided to do nothing. Yes. Can you explain it? I can't explain it. I don't know why that made the difference. But I know it did. There's no difference between life in prison and a death penalty. None whatsoever. Both for a sense of death. The two attorneys said they couldn't speak up because they couldn't betray their client. Right. Can you sympathize with that? Yes. Sympathize with it, yes. Understand it, no. Because if you know this is an innocent person, why would you allow an innocent person to be prosecuted, convicted, sent to prison for all these years? What did you do to see if there might be some loophole to get everyone out of this fix? I researched the ethics of the client, attorney-client privilege as much as I could. I contacted people who are involved with making those determinations. I know Jamie did the same thing. I could not figure out a way, and still cannot figure out a way, how we could have done anything to, to help Alton Logan that would not have put Andrew Wilson in jeopardy of another capital case. Couldn't you have leaked it to somebody, to a reporter, to an administrator, to the governor, to somebody? The only thing we could have leaked is that Andrew Wilson confessed to us. And how could we leak that to anybody without getting, putting him in jeopardy? It may cause us to lose some sleep, but, but I'd lose more sleep if I had put Andrew Wilson's neck in the, in the noose. He was guilty and Logan was not, so yes. His head should be in the news, and Logan should go free. It's perfectly obvious to somebody who isn't a lawyer. Andrew Wilson was guilty, was he not? Yes. And that's up to the system to decide. It's not up to me as his lawyer to decide that he was guilty, and so he should be punished, and Logan should go free. Do you think he might have been disbarred for doing that? For violating attorney-client privilege? I don't think I considered that as much as I considered my responsibility to my client. I was very concerned to protect him. But here was a case where two men, you two, were caught up in this bind and chose to let a man run away in jail. It seems that way. But had we come forward right away, aside from violating our own client's privilege and putting him in jeopardy, would the information that we had have been valued? Would we'll anybody have done anything? Probably not, they say. Because as a violation of attorney-client privilege, it never would have been allowed in court. They insist right. that for them, there was no way out. In terms of my conscience, my conscience is that I did the right thing. Do I feel bad about Logan? Absolutely, I feel bad about Logan. The two attorneys say they were so tormented over Logan's imprisonment that they convinced Wilson to let them reveal that Wilson was the real killer after Wilson's death. Late last year, Wilson died. The two attorneys finally took that affidavit out of the lockbox and contacted Logan's lawyer. Public defender Harold Winston had already been trying to get Logan a new trial. He'd found two eyewitnesses who swore Logan was not the killer. Now, with Kunz and Coventry's affidavit, he thinks Logan will finally go free. I know the Attorney General's Office of Illinois is considering this, and I have a lot of respect for that office, and I'm hoping they will come to the right conclusion that a mistake has been made. And if they do that, he would go free. And even though Harold Winston represents Alton Logan, he agrees the two attorneys had to remain silent until Wilson died. I wish there had been a way this could have come out earlier. Under the could Illinois Ethics Code, I think the only way would have been if Andrew Wilson had released his lawyers earlier. There may be other attorneys who have similar secrets that they're keeping. Um, I don't want to be too defensive about this, but what, make, what makes this case so different is that Dale and I came forward, and that Dale had the good sense to, to talk to Wilson before his death and said, and get his permission, if, if you die, can we talk? Without that, 
we wouldn't be here today. See, I never stopped giving up hope. I've always believed that one day it's going, somebody's going to come forth and tell the truth. But I didn't know when. If you were to meet up with Logan, if you were visiting him in his cell, what would you say to him? There's nothing you can't say. Well, I mean, we have, it's been difficult for us, but there's no comparison whatsoever to what it's been for this poor guy. How has it been difficult for them? Alton, whether or not you can understand it, we've been hurting for you for 26 years. How much does it hurt? How often did I think about it? Probably 250 times a year. I mean, I thought about it regularly. Everything that was dear to me is gone. You missed the funeral of your mother? Yes. His brothers, Eugene and Tony, told us they've shared Alton's pain, and they always knew that he was no killer. My brother ain't got uh, nature to do nothing in his soul. He ain't gonna take nobody else's life. We weren't raised like that. Your brother's 54 now. Mm -hmm. Can he start again at the age of 54? Well, I think we're gonna make it. Mm -hmm. If he get from behind them bars, um, I'm gonna turn him back on to life. And we're gonna live it together. We're gonna live it together. But you're still here. Yeah. But you got to understand the system. And the system works slowly. They are quick to convict, but they are slow to correct their mistakes. All I want to know is the truth. All I want is the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Yes, it will. One month after our report, the truth finally did set Alton Logan free. A judge, citing the new evidence, threw out his conviction and released Logan on just $1,000 bond. Illinois' Attorney General will not appeal the ruling and is deciding whether to retry Alton or to simply drop the charges.